for the latest in strategic affairs subscribe to our youtube channel click the bell icon for updates this is strat news global i am amita brevi on talking point today we are looking at more and continuous chinese bullying in the west philippine sea A warm welcome to all our viewers and a welcome from uh, Manila to uh, one of our regular panelists, Don McLean Gill. He's a lecturer at the Department of International Studies at the De La Salle University and is also co-editor of a book that was out a couple of months back called The Elephants Rise in the East. Don, thanks for giving us time again. Thank you so much, Amita. Always a pleasure in all of the world. Pleasure is always asked, Don. If you could, you know, simply... Explain to uh, those viewers who don't know the history or the background uh, in the run-up to the latest Chinese Coast Guard provocation over what's called the Second Thomas, or I think in uh, the Philippines it's called uh, Ayungin Chol, a dispute that goes back decades to even Mischief Island and uh, the Philippines scuttling the World War II ship uh, Sierra Madre in 1999, right? Right. Thank you. That's that's an excellent starting point. You know. It is. It isn't even a question about legality anymore. Okay, so particularly the human shoal, for example, lies within Philippine EZ, you know, over which the Philippines has clear and undeniable sovereign rights and jurisdiction. The resupply missions to the BRP Sierra Madre, for example, are well in line with international law and UNCLOS. In fact, the 2016 arbitral uh, ruling affirms UNCLOS. And in fact, based on general observable patterns, right? If we look into the past few decades as exactly what you were just saying, such provocations are not new, all right? And they are not surprising either. This form of harassment, along with other gray zone activities that China continues to conduct within Philippine EEZ, is aimed at provoking Philippine sovereignty and sovereign rights directly without triggering a shooting war or any sort of military guarantees under the treaty alliance with the United States. So when we look into the motivations of China, I think a general observation that we could look into would be in both internal and external variants, right? So you have a national system of governance in Beijing that largely banks on nationalism and nationalist sentiments. And engaging in such maneuvers, such as the most recent one, including the, the water cannon issue, and on top of that, uh, blocking uh, Philippine Coast Guard vessels in Philippine waters, you know, these sort of provocative measures that are not in line with international law continues to benefit the regime seat of power in Beijing at a time when China is expected to further solidify, you know, its fear of influence in Asia at the expense of U.S. leadership. Unfortunately, until a significant level of cost uh, will be imposed on such tactics that China continues to do, you know, China will continue to indulge in them, uh, particularly in the West Philippine Sea, to slowly cement its strategic position within Philippine EEC, while also slowly altering the status quo narrative to its favor. We've seen this in 1995 and in 2012. And just very briefly, you know, this was, uh, you know, China's recent assertion after the incident a few days ago uh, regarding a claims that the Philippines promised uh, to tow away the BRP Shera Madre, uh, the Shera Madre, uh, is an example of twisting the narratives because this was ab uh, abruptly rejected uh, by Manila because of its lack and absence of clear documentation or official uh, agreements. So this is twisting the narrative, twisting the geography, and of course, twisting the balance of power to its favor slowly. As you point out, uh, President Marcos immediately denied any uh, agreement of the sort. This twisting of the narrative that you talked about and said, even if there was something of the sort, he was resigning it immediately. But just again, going back to uh, one of your earlier points about uh, the motivation of uh, China. China constantly testing, you know, across the globe. It's not just uh, here, but 
gauging how far it can go away. and gauging the reactions from say the Philippines and the US and how uh, Manila's response has been seen is there a feeling that overall the Chinese if they blink it's only in the face of strength and uh, result right and we have to understand the, the particular patterns that we can see from China particularly in uh, the West Philippine Sea, the Greater South China Sea, if you will, and throughout maritime Indo-Pacific. You know, we have to understand that China realizes that its military, despite being quantitatively superior, is still questionable in terms of its operational capabilities. In fact, when we talk about the Indian Ocean region, China's far seas operations are also still quite limited. So because of these limitations, in accordance to in addition to the other demographic issues that are in place as well, for example. Um, China conducts a series of salami slicing activities that involves hard, soft, and sharp power disinformation, for example, to be able to slowly but surely alter the status quo without the overt use of military force. It has done that in the East China Sea. It has done that uh, in 2012 uh, vis-a-vis the Scarborough Shoal, for example. So this is what China is particularly doing. Uh, and in fact, if we could say that, you know, it would just be a walk in the park for China to just engage militarily. But yes, it has militarily wrapped up its capabilities in the South China Sea. And in fact, in 2018, um, you know, the soon-to-be uh, Indo-Pacific chief, Philip Davidson at that time, stated that China has controlled the South China Sea short of war with the United States. And that's the quote. China is aware that war would be costly. So this is how it is trying to opt its ante by engaging in a number of strategies that do not really involve the overt use of military force, which may trigger, all right, which may trigger the commitments under treaty alliances. This is the same with what's happening between the U.S. and Japan and the U.S. and Australia against China's assertiveness in the maritime domain. So what needs to be done is consistency and upholding international law, in upholding in the Philippines' position uh, the 2016 arbitral ruling that really serves to show that China's expansive claims are not in line with international law. So China's just looking for uh, a series of gaps in policy to be able to exploit. And, you know, fortunately, under the Marcus Jr. administration, uh, the Philippines has shown a strong will, a strong position, to proactively engage based on these security developments. Sure. Uh, one analyst, I think, pointing out exactly what you're saying in terms of uh, uh, China crossing the line. It won't stop until it, if it can force the Philippines out of our union. If it succeeds, it'll move on to the next target and the next until. Uh, the analyst said that the Philippines is completely expelled from its own EEZ and then it will move against other countries which is actually doing uh, simultaneously. Is there a broad-based understanding of that and a uh, collective approach to dealing with China or as you're saying is China being able to exploit the weakness? Right, and this is a challenge. All right. So China is able to do what it is doing, uh, not only in the Western Pacific, but also in the Indian Ocean. Uh, I call it geopositional balancing, using vast financial capabilities uh, to achieve strategic ends without strategic risks in terms of the military confrontation. And China continues to do this time and time and again. Uh, so, however, what we are looking into is more awareness particularly in terms of Indo-Pacific countries, like-minded Indo-Pacific countries that realize that uh, China's desire to go beyond and alter the rules-based order, for example, through its uh, global security initiative, is something that comes at the expense of regional countries, such as the Philippines and other Southeast Asian countries. However, if you zoom in into Southeast Asia, when we look into the collective action of ASEAN, for example, even that contains a lot of limitations for collective action. 
Now, this is one of China's strategies in order to further its strategic interests in the South China Sea. A divided ASEAN, for example, is something of China's benefit. However, Manila, since 2022, under the Marcos Jr. administration, was quick to recognize the large discrepancy between what China says at the political level and what it does on the ground. So the Philippines was quick to tap and leverage on its uh, uh, traditional ally, the United States, not only deepening uh, its security engagements, but broadening, well, broadening it as well. You see the expansion of EDCA, for example, the involvement of a sinking uh, factory in the Balikatan exercises in 2022. Um, and of course, uh, we, we, we also look into other, um, other initiatives that involve narrowing the functional gap of the hub and spoke system in the Western Pacific between Japan, Australia, and the United States. The Philippines is also a treaty ally. So it's trying to signal its intent to narrow that functional gap for collective measures. And in fact, Manila has also focused on enhancing its partnerships with non-traditional partners. And this is where India also plays a significant role. In fact, uh, the Philippine-India strategic partnership is well underway it's going to it's going positively, and this is a great sign of proactivity from the government. You're talking about international law. Uh, you've seen how uh, China continues to evade you know, international law and continues to do what it it really wants to do. Just wanted to get uh, your perspective on where is the code of conduct uh, talks that are been going on for so long does it really help and you also talked about the u.s treaty now that is only triggered like you said the chinese don't cross that line right when there's either damage or death after shots are fired right uh, very briefly on the treaty alliance with the u.s it is true the gray zone tactics that fall short of war or short of uh, you know military escalation is something that continues to challenge uh, the significance of this treaty, particularly against Chinese assertiveness, while there are talks ongoing on how to include certain raison tactics within the guarantees, it is still not clear how this will be done. Now, regarding the code of conduct, there's another issue here. You know, China is now significantly altering not only the balance of power, but also the geography of the South China Sea to its favor. And the question here is, Will China still need a code of conduct? Would it look at it more favorably or as a means that may suppress its already um, uh, growing power projection capabilities in the South China Sea? And since the 21st century, China has stopped providing concessions. As it continues to grow, as it continues to strengthen, it becomes more unwilling to compromise. The DCOC, for example, in the early 2000s, still reflected a little more um, uh, restraint on China's, on China's side, particularly towards Southeast Asian countries. So it agreed, okay, let's make this sort of informal framework that may lead to an official code of conduct. But as you all know, the code of conduct is still nowhere to be seen. And the question is, if there would be a code of conduct, in an unlikely scenario, would it still have the necessary tools and instruments to manage China's growing assertion? That's another question, because China is against uh, certain proposals of the Code of Conduct, for example, in mentioning the 2016 arbitral ruling, and that really ro rules out its historic claims that are not in line with international law. And with the way things are going right now, it may be difficult to convince China to restrain its capabilities or its movements um, through a code of conduct that would be binding. So that's another issue. So the press, there are two scenarios here. So either the code of conduct does not really materialize, or if it does materialize, it may not be as effective as we all hoped that it would be. So this is another issue that we are facing with the code of conduct. Right, I and mean, we've seen bilateral agreements and treaties with India, which have been, you know, all over the decades signed with the Chinese, which are virtually being drawn up anyway. But it's just interesting that these this latest round of hostilities comes 
soon after the Chinese envoy in the Philippines offers informally, I believe, uh, to have uh, joint military drills or exercise. Now, what's uh, all that about? Is that diverting? Hell right, and, and that's a very interesting question. You know, that idea was floated on the 96th anniversary celebration of the PLA. The Chinese ambassador floated the idea, right? And the AFP, the armed forces of the Philippines, said that it would not close its doors to such a proposal. It would be under study, under scrutiny. But we have to understand, all right, defense diplomacy has significantly increased in its utility in both East, in its utility in both on racial front, bilateral military drills allow countries to increase uh, their mutual awareness and familiarization about each other's military technologies. This creates a functional opportunity to train with each other's crew to address common issues. On the symbolic front, however, uh, this is also more important that it uh, signifies the bilateral military exercises as important sources of strategic signaling, often against a third country that is perceived as a threat. Now, given the sensitivity of these exercises, they also demonstrate how militaries from both sides possess common goals in the region. However, we have to understand that Conducting military exercises does not really provide incentives or benefits right away, right? They're not automatic, and they would depend on uh, the conditions, the existing conditions of bilateral uh, relations, particularly in terms of having a strong foundation of trust, transparency, and communication. However, at the most basic level, Beijing continues to veer away from being a trustworthy neighbor. Uh, grave inconsistencies such as when President Marcos Jr. met President Xi Jinping in January 2023, there were pledges to alleviate the discord at sea. But days after, or rather weeks after, provocations by the Chinese coast guarded the West Philippine Sea occurred. Days after the Chinese foreign minister's visit to Manila, the same provocations occurred days after again. And interestingly, you know, a goodwill visit from China to Manila came just two months after a veiled threat. Uh, against OFWs or overseas Filipino workers in Taiwan by China. So there is a lack of transparency and accountability. All right. So, in fact, China even refused to pick up the hotline uh, after the, uh, the most recent altercation. And it was there for a particular reason, right? So, the lack of transparency and accountability and the ability to switch narratives is also worrying in terms of strengthening security ties with China, right? So what it may be arguing, however, that joint drills may be limited to a non-traditional security well, you know, that does not involve the West Philippine Sea. It is important for Manila, particularly, to evaluate, you know, whether such drills would be sustainable and effective in the long term, particularly towards Philippine security, or will this merely be as a, you know, it'll just serve as a temporary symbol of accommodation towards an increasingly asserted Beijing. So these are the questions that we need to roll out. So in theory, it may be possible, but if we look into its benefits and long-term sustainability, that may be something that you'd like to question. You mentioned on uh, President uh, Bombo Marcos' trip to Beijing in January 23 and meeting with Xi Jinping and other leaders. But how is his policy uh, perceived in uh, China? He clearly seems to be, as you mentioned earlier in this discussion as well, pushing for more cooperation ties with the U.S. But is there also a perception that the Philippines is being drawn into the U.S.-China confrontation? And uh, linked to that is how is he seeing vis-a-vis -vis his predecessor, um, President Duterte's policies? Right, and in fact... Well, that is the common narrative within Beijing. If you look into the Global Times, for example, uh, that the Philippines, for example, is being seen as a puppet of the West. Uh, this is seen as a common narrative within uh, China. Uh, and in fact, we have to understand that China is aware and well wary of a situation where the Philippines will continue to work with the United States at the expense of China's narrowly driven regional ambitions. 
And in fact, uh, you mentioned about former President Duterte. Uh, he, in fact, met President Xi Jinping in Beijing also uh, just a few weeks ago. And President Xi Jinping uh, talked about uh, promoting friendly relations with the Philippines as a necessity. But again, days after, uh, you have this uh, water cannon incident that occurred. So it is not about being a source of insecurity for China. The Philippines has already made its point clear that it wants to be and maintain cordial relations with China, right? Because it is our largest neighbor. We cannot just cut off our largest immediate neighbor, but it would not allow itself to be subjected to China's narrowly driven designs. And this is where proactivity in terms of strengthening its defense network uh, enhancing its uh, maritime security initiatives uh, and fast-tracking its military modernization program. All of this play a role in securing Philippine sovereignty and sovereign rights. And this is a defensive position against an increasingly assertive China, but China tries to flip it into something offensive. But that's not the case. And no one really can be, uh, you know, that gullible to believe that this is an offensive posture. It's just clearly defensive in terms of securing Philippine sovereignty and sovereign rights based on international law. But again, this is something that is not considered pleasing to China. You mentioned, Don, uh, briefly India and how India is important to the region and especially to the uh, Philippines. And when you're talking about defense management, uh, security, uh, enlarging your um, defense perspective, after all, the first sale of the Ramos uh, supersonic missiles as a deterrent to for uh, the Philippines has been uh, from India. If you want to expand on uh, what you think India's role can and should be. Well, definitely India is stepping up its position, its role as a practical and, of course, a significant uh, security and development partner beyond the Indian Ocean region and into uh, the Western Pacific. And in fact, if we look into the recent uh, state of the Southeast Asia survey, a very prominent survey uh, of Southeast Asian countries towards the security realm, we can see that India's position as an alternative partner amid the enhanced U.S.-China power competition is significant. You know, Southeast Asian countries have been welcoming of India's role as a legitimate and responsible security partner. There's no doubt in that. And in fact, the Philippines itself recognizes the significance. Uh, Philippine Foreign Secretary uh, Enrique Manalo uh, was in India just a few weeks ago uh, in order to engage with Dr. Jay Shanta in terms of enhancing uh, the scope of the strategic partnership, the evolving strategic partnership between Manila and New Delhi. And this is something quite significant at a time when President Barcus Jr. announced to his new ambassadors, uh, newly appointed ambassadors, that we need to enhance cooperation in security and trade with non-traditional partners. And this is where India fits quite neatly. In fact, the public perception towards India and the Philippines also continues to improve and improve. And uh, the Indian government, uh, through its embassy in Manila, also continues to proactively engage uh, with the government in several areas, multi-dimensional areas, not only in traditional defense, uh, but also areas such as a potential assistance in cybersecurity and all other forms of um, uh, engagement and cooperation in strategic realms. And this is a very positive signal. Uh, and in fact, I believe, I personally believe that uh, when the Philippines-India partnership really gained significant momentum, that was in 2016, what we are seeing now is a further increase in that momentum. So I believe that this is not going to go away. And I believe that the conditions are set both externally and internally uh, for solidifying the, the partnership between the Philippines and India, particularly in the security realm. Don McLean Gill, again, absolutely appreciate you giving us uh, time and thank you for sharing your perspective again on Stat News Group. Thank you so much, Amita. And for all our viewers to follow our social media handles, uh, 
to follow our Telegram channel. You will get updates when we put up articles on our website and interviews like this with Don Gill on our YouTube channel. This is Talking Point on Stat News Global. I'm Amit Afrit.